Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. Lots to get to today as Don Lemon returns to CNN without apologizing on air. That's brave. And the censoring of Willy Wonka. How dare they? How dare they touch that sacred text? We'll get to it all, uh, as well as today's headlines in just a bit. But my first guest today says he has unlocked the secret to defying the aging process. How'd you like to be in your 50s, but biologically be more like someone in their 30s? It's possible. Dr. Mike Mark Hyman says that while he is physically 63 years old, biologically, he's only 43. He says he has the blueprint on how we can all feel the same, much, much younger than we are chronologically, and he is share here to share that secret. His new book is Young Forever. It's a good title, right? Young Forever, The Secrets to Living Your Longest, Healthiest Life. For many parts of the country, February weather is cold and unforgiving, including my part of the country. The days are short, sunlight can be hard to come by, and on those days, relaxing by the pool seems all too far away. Or is it? When you have a Michael Phelps swim spa by Master Spas, you can enjoy the best of a pool and the therapy of a hot tub too, even in the middle of winter. Picture it. Michael Phelps swim spas come in a variety of sizes to complement almost any yard. You're not ruled out if you have a teeny tiny backyard. Michael Phelps swim spas by Master Spas have a water current so you can swim, do aquatic exercises, and have fun with the kids, even in the middle of winter. The water buoyancy will relieve pressure on your aching joints. And since it's heated, you can use it year round in any climate, and you should. You can enjoy it out there. You can go out there with a glass of wine. You can go out there and get your exercise. You're going to go out there and hang out with the fam. It's all good. Michael Phelps Swim Spas are 100% made in the USA by Master Spas, the world's largest swim spa manufacturer. You will love your Michael Phelps Swim Spa by Master Spas. Go to masterspas.com, put in the promo code MK, and save $1,000 on a Michael Phelps Swim Spa or $500 on a Master Spas hot tub. Masterspas.com, promo code MK. Welcome to the show, Dr. Mark Hyman. Great to see you again. Good to see you too again, Megan. How's it going? Oh, it's a pleasure. It's going great. Um, all right, so this is Young Forever. I mean, who doesn't want that? Uh, Absolutely. And I love <laughs> listening to your stories because you're you're not you're not contending that we're not going to age chronologically. That's going to happen, but that not only can we feel younger. That's something we've been told for years. We can we can not only feel we can kind of get younger. Yeah. On the inside, when it comes to our health and our likely longevity and the the wellness that we can expect of ourselves as we age. So explain that. That's right. It's not just about more years to your life. It's more life in your years. And the key is to understand that for the first time, we have the ability to measure our biological age, which we never had before. So we can see based on what we're doing, our lifestyle, our habits, whatever we're doing, how that affects our biological age. And the truth is most of us have come to expect disease, frailty, disability, dysfunction, and decrepitude as sort of the normal consequences <laughs> of getting older, but they're not. It turns out the science is very clear that there are actually dysfunctions that are a disease process that can be treated, reversed, and that's the whole point of my book, Young Forever, is to unlock this new science of longevity and teach people how, with very simple, affordable practices, they can reverse their biological clock, even as they get chronologically older. All right. And I want to tell people, I should have mentioned this up top, uh, you went to Cornell undergrad, you I went did. to the University of Ottawa, <laughs> uh, faculty, uh, faculty of medicine there, you're a practicing family physician, you're mm -hmm. MD, 14-time New York Times bestseller, and also the head of strategy and innovation at the Cleveland Clinic. Center for Functional Medicine. That's what we're talking about, functional medicine. That's what your Absolutely. specialty is. So yes. you know of what you speak. Decrepitude is a hilarious word for the aging <laughs> process. <laughs> yeah, it kind of gets the point home, you know? I mean, it's just really, really you look does. around, you go, well, nobody wants to be 100 years old because by the time you get to be 100, you're like, you know, barely can get out. You can, maybe you're in yes. a nursing home, you're frail. I saw a guy on a horse who was 100 years old riding around in Costa Rica. That's impressive, you know, because he's one of the blue zones where they naturally incorporate the habits of how to live a long time just by default. I mean, we need to learn from them. The, and we need to incorporate some of the more advanced, um, incredible advances in longevity science, but we can actually reverse our biological clock and stay vital and fit as we get older. And I know at 63, I'm way more 
fit and stronger and capable than I was when I was 30. And it's it's really remarkable to see how by applying this longevity science, we can literally turn back our clocks and mm. add a lot of value to our lives because most of us walk around feeling like crap. You know, we have retired, we're sluggish, we can't sleep great, we have digestive issues, joint pains, maybe headaches, congestion, who knows what. And I call it FLC syndrome. That's when you feel like crap. And, and we come mm. to expect that as normal. Oh, well, I used to be able to do this, but I can't do that. Nonsense. We actually know if we know how to regulate our biology, how to turn back the clock and use the advances in longevity science to heal what we call the hallmarks of aging. We can talk about that, but it's basically all this shit that goes wrong. Can I say that on radio? Yeah, all this shit that goes wrong uh, that actually is not a normal part of aging. It's an abnormal aging. And we all are going to get older. We're all going to get, you know, you know, progressively older, but we don't have to be in that category, people who end up with the last 20% of their lives in poor health. We can feel good up until the end and then go. Like, you know, I've seen many people with like live to be 100 and then they just kind of go to bed and that's it. That's kind of how we should yes. go. Yes, that's how, that's what we all want. That's the dream. Or we're going to get to the blue zones too in a minute. But let's just start with, um, and a couple of things that you said. How do we check? So, because there is a thing you can check. You said uh, in the book, either yeah. a blood test or maybe even a saliva check test. Yeah. So and that anyone can get to figure out how old you That's are right. right now on the inside. That's right. I mean, you know, we we have um, this amazing ability to reprogram our genes. Uh, people don't realize that, but we can actually measure the rate at which our genes are aging. In a sense, there's this program called the epigenetic program, which is regulating how our genes are expressed or regulated. And so our genes aren't fixed. We can't change those, but the way they're expressed is influenced by what we eat and exercise, how we think, environmental toxins, our nutritional status, our microbiome, all these things wash over our genes and regulate the epigenome, which is modifiable. So the, 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 the keyboards on a piano are 88 keys. You can't change that. Same thing with your genes. you got 20,000 genes. You can't change that. But the piano player can play classical, ragtime, jazz, rock, reggae, whatever. And that is the epigenome the epigenome can be changed. And so the new tests are measuring the rate of your biological aging through your epigenetic marks on your genes. And that changes over time. In one study, they reversed the biological age of the participants by eating a healthy diet and some simple lifestyle practices using a functional medicine framework. In eight weeks, they reversed their biological age by three years using this diagnostic metric. Now, how is it, is this telomeres? Is this what they're no? They're it's not telomeres. Or is it's that called DNA different? methylation. It's it's basically it's a, it's a, telomeres also are measured, and that's another way of looking at your rate of aging. There are many other ways, but but this is a really important way because uh, it's it's really powerful to see what's happening to the epigenome, which is the regulator of aging, and so it's measuring what we call DNA methylation. It's basically little marks on your DNA with a carbon and three hydrogens that it is a signal to turn on or off this gene or regulate this pathway. And that's exactly what, what we can influence by what we eat, by how we exercise, by our thoughts and, and belief systems, by our social connections, by reducing our exposure to toxins. All these things help to optimize our epigenome. So do you go to the doctor, your your primary care physician, and say, <laughs> I want to well, check you, my epigenome? Or how, how do you test for this? You could. You could. They might look at you cross-eyed because they it takes yeah. about 20 years for scientific advances to end up in the clinic. But you, you can go online literally and order a home test. Uh, and there's a number wow. of labs out there. I don't have any affiliation with them, but one is called True Diagnostic that uh, provides a, a whole comprehensive set of, of age-related tests and diagnostics. There's other labs that do it. And I think there's an emerging science. So we're constantly refining and improving the diagnostics. But it's something you can do. It's 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 not terribly expensive. It's probably three, two hundred, between two hundred to five hundred dollars for the testing. And and then you can see, oh, where am I at? And if you're like 60 and it shows up 40, awesome. If you're 60 and it shows up 70, it's time to get to work. You know, Keep reading. Keep reading. <laughs> Wait, and just to, just to be perfectly clear, so for the audience, what should they Google to find these tests? Should they Google epigenome and then the name go, of that lab? Yeah, they can go DNA methylation testing. Uh, one of the labs is True Diagnostic that I use, but there, there's others. Yeah, DNA methylation, okay. epigenetic okay. testing. I don't know. You can, you'll find it. All right, so, that's age, so if you could reduce it to testing. by, if you could reduce it, your your you know your age, your biological age by three years and eight weeks, does that mean in you know 
two years of can living well. Can you go back well, to zero? Re- <laughs> yeah. Like how, I mean, could, could I be like sweet 16 again? How low could we go? <laughs> That's a great question. I don't know. We don't know. We haven't tested and figured it out yet. I think uh, it's very reasonable to expect you can get a 10 or 20 year reversal. The You know, if you're obviously you're older, if you're 20, you're not going to get a 20 year reversal, but yeah. you can actually start to see these, these metrics change. And we're learning all the time about how far we can go. I'm, I'm curious if I can get to 25. I'm applying all these new strategies that I wrote about in my book, Long, Young Forever, about how to reverse my biological age. I'm 63, but biologically 43, but I've been living a healthy lifestyle most of my life. So I, even though I've had some health issues, I've been able to actually keep my body working pretty well. So I think, mm-hmm. I think, uh, I don't know is the answer to the question, but I think we'll find out soon enough. And I think uh, what's even more kind of sci-fi I talk about in the book is new discoveries that allow us to reprogram our genes and our cells to a younger you. So maybe there's at some point in 10, 15 years where you'll be able to take some um, factor externally that will re reactivate or return on these transcription factors called Yamanaka factors that have been implanted in you externally, and they can actually reverse your genes. So if you see you're 50 and you have arthritis, or your skin's a little wrinkled, your hair's a little gray, your getting metabolism's bad, your muscles are kind of wasting, you can turn on this switch and turn back the clock to 25. Now, that's kind mm-hmm. of happening in animal studies right now. It's not really? in human studies, but it's really wild. Like, for example, they're taking blind mice and, and actually... Re- programming their cells to a younger version that actually regains their sight. So that kind oh of is God. mind blowing, but that's, that's not uh, available right now, but it's kind of talks about the potential we have to literally turn on these ancient healing systems in our body. See, that's the whole thing, Megan, that's so remarkable about the science for so many years, we've been treating disease and we're going down the wrong path. We need to be discovering what creates health. And the body has its Wait, own- and let me stop you there. Let me stop you there, because I love this piece of your book. I, this was an aha moment for me. And by yeah. the way, just to remind people, this is this guy's at the Cleveland Clinic. Is This is not some <laughs> lunatic out there who's like, no, you can reverse aging. This I'm is real. Bit, That's what's so I'm exciting. I'm a little bit of a lunatic, but- <laughs> No, you're not a lunatic. You're a very well-respected doctor, work with the Clinton Foundation, all this stuff. So um, <laughs> that's why you're exciting, because you're real, and this actually could help a lot of people. But when I was listening, because I listened to the audio, um, y- you're, it, you talk about, okay, Maybe you don't, maybe you're not obese. Maybe you don't smoke. Mm -hmm. You're feeling good Mm -hmm. about yourself. That's Mm -hmm. me. I'm like, okay, I'm healthy. You know, I I don't smoke and I'm not obese. And I know those are two huge problems when it comes to healthcare. You're you're aging. Age is like disease. Getting older is your biggest risk factor for cancer, for heart attack, for all the things. I'm like, oh crap, I'm aging right now. I am doing the thing he says I shouldn't be doing right at this second. Oh my God, there I go again. And everybody's doing that. And so that's where your book comes in. Like, that's right. what if you didn't have to? What if you could be as aggressive in that lane as you are about not smoking, as you are about not yeah. getting, you know, overweight? Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole key is that, you know, you, you know, a 35-year-old smoker has a far lower risk of cancer than a seven-year-old non-smoker. And that's because of these hallmarks of aging, these, these fundamental biological systems that go awry and start to malfunction that we can influence. And for years we thought that, you know, these these things that happen as we get older, these chronic disease of aging were inevitable. Heart disease, diabetes, dementia, cancer. But they're they're really just downstream from these processes that get screwed up by our lifestyle primarily that we can influence and that will literally reprogram us to a younger you. So the, the key to understand these hallmarks is that they underlie all disease. So if we if we cured heart disease and cancer from the face of the planet, we might see seven years of life extension, which is good, but not super impressive. If we God. fixed all these hallmarks of aging, we might see 30 or 40 years of life extension. That means living to be 120 years old. So that's the key is to work upstream to the diseases and not be playing whack-a-mole and treating all these diseases with drugs or trying to find the cure for Alzheimer's. It's never going to work. You've got to get to these underlying processes that are causing all the diseases. And then you need to figure out what's causing the problem with these processes, which is really where functional medicine comes in. It's the framework of understanding the cause. It's the the why medicine. And it's mm-hmm. really pretty simple. You're either getting too much of something your body doesn't like or not enough of what your body needs to function properly. Too much of the impediments to health and not enough of the ingredients for health. And we know what those are. It's not a long list. The things you want to get rid of are 
bad diet, too much stress, sedentary lifestyle, you know, toxins, allergens, bugs, microbes sometimes play a role in your microbiome. And then you want all the things that your body needs to function well. If you want to grow a garden or do anything, you have to know how to grow plants. The same thing with a human. We have to have the right food, the right nutrients, right balance of hormones, light, air, clean water, rhythm in our lives, rest, uh, exercise, good sleep, connection, community, meaning, purpose, love. These are all just basic ingredients for health. So, So once you figure that out, we can live a very long time. And that's what these blue zones do. They they, they may automatically have these things in yeah, the Yeah, let's right talk about this. What, define blue zone. You know, so blue zone was basically an area where people live very long. Like the other areas in the world where they have the longest lived people. So for example, they have 20 times the number of people reaching 100 years old than we do in America. And it, are they genetically different or is something going on in their lifestyle or their environment that's making them live a long time turns out when they move to america they die at the same rate they have the uh, same longevity as we do we kill it's, them right it, off yeah we kill them off it's true <laughs> uh, there's many studies that show that so in the blue zones by default they're doing all the right things it's sort of automatic they don't think about it and they, well, i'm going to go to the gym and i'm going to eat this and i'm going to have go to whole foods and i'm going <laughs> to meditate no no they basically have a diet that's super rich in simple, whole, real foods. They eat lots of vegetables. They, they have lots of beans. They have, a, like, if they have animal products, these are animals are raised you know, on all the local plants grazing around. They have lots of goats and sheep, typically, which are uh, a big staple in their diet. And they're not eating sugar. There are tons of sugar. They're not eating processed food. They're eating lots of good fats. They're having lots of fish. So they're having a really healthy diet. The second is they're moving naturally. It's just they don't exercise, quote, exercise. But this guy Pietro was a guy I met who was 95 years old, bolt upright, clear eyes, booming voice, uh, fit as a fiddle. I mean, 95, right? He would literally just stop uh, being a shepherd the year before where he was walking five miles a day up the Rocky Mountains in Sardinia you know, hurting his sheep. Well, that's just natural exercise. He had to lift and do and move. We just don't use our bodies. So they naturally use our bodies. And they also had uh, very low levels of chronic stress. I mean, they they weren't out there, you know, overachieving this and that and doing startups and working, you know, 90 hours a week. They they did what they did to survive. And they, they, they had this beautiful life of, you know, their local vegetable gardening and growing food and their, their basic kind of keeping their their systems going, but they also had this deep sense of connection and and community and belonging. And no, there was no nursing homes. I met this woman, Julia, who was uh, 103 months. She's like, I'm 103 months, like I'm five and three quarters, you know? <laughs> and she lived with her niece. She never had kids. She was never married, but she lived with her niece because the family just took them in. And so really, uh, they, they, they really had this beautiful sense of of community. And you, you, we met this guy, Carmine, he just, we were driving down this, this uh, road by on the side of this mountain. And, and this guy pulls in front of us, like blocks our car and then gets out and then sits on this stone wall. And he's like this 86 year old guy. And he's like, I'm like, what's going on to my guy. And they're like, Oh, he just wants to talk. So we just sat and talked for like an hour. And then we showed us where his, his farm was, where basically he's, he'd been growing food forever. He had orchards and animals and sheep and growing tons of vegetables and he tended it all himself at 86 years old and he just wanted to sit and chat for hours you know <laughs> it was like yeah. who does that in america so they have a deep sense of, of connection and community which is which is a big thing if you want to look at you know one of the biggest killers you know for example being socially isolated and disconnected is is the equivalent of smoking two packs a day in terms of its effect on oh. your health oh my god i'm thinking about my nana my mom's mom um, she died in, in 2016, October of 2016, and she had just turned 101. And she, oh. go, she went against, <laughs> but so she went against most of your rules, but yeah. not until later in life. You know, she was born in 1915. <laughs> and so she grew up, of course, like anybody who was born in 1915, eating natural foods, not processed foods. But the second half of life, she was pretty sedentary. She was overweight. She ate, t- she ate nothing but processed food. She loved them. Um, Amazing. She didn't exercise much. However, however, she had two things. She had a great sense of humor, so she yeah. she didn't she she had some anxiety about like people getting hurt in her family, things like that. But she wasn't a stressed out person. 
but she was immersed in her community. The Catholic yeah. Daughters, the Senior Citizens Home. Yeah. Um, they used to go on the mystery trips to New York City mm-hmm. and go to Broadway together. Even the independent living community that she ultimately yeah. moved into, it wasn't a nursing home, it was independent living. But she would walk up and down the halls. They all knew each other. It was like <laughs> living in a sorority slash fraternity where they all took care of each other. They all had parties together for their birthday. So honestly, like that yeah. nurturing yeah. of her social needs I'm convinced that's what kept her alive as long as she did. Totally, totally. I mean, it, it reminds me of a story of uh, Rosetta, Pennsylvania, where this group of uh, Italian community came over almost as a whole community and, and sort of set up shop in this town. And they they had, you know, different socioeconomic statuses, but they all knew each other. They all celebrated everything together, weddings, births, holidays, whatever. We're just a deeply not tight-knit community. And they adopted the typical American diet, but they weren't getting sick like the average American. And and it was fascinating to see how even despite their crappy lifestyle, they actually, because of this power of connection and belonging community, they actually lived a long, long time. Right. And I think that's a very important message. Oh, can I tell you, I just interviewed Cece Moore. She's this, the famed genealog- genetic genealogist who helps solve crimes. I mean, legitimately has solved a bunch of crimes by studying your genes and figuring out who you might be related to. Like, like the case of Brian Kohlberger out in Idaho, you know, they found yeah. some genetic DNA, whatever. She talked to me about some community in Pennsylvania that was largely Italian, and they all sort of moved to the same place, and one of them turned out to be a terrible killer, just as a little epilogue to your story. (laughs) I'm sure it was a different community. (laughs) Oh, no, no. Totally different It wasn't that much. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But wait, can can I ask you something about the Mediterranean diet? Because this is always very attractive, Mm because we, you know— if you if you go over to Italy, if you go to you know Greece, whatever, mm-hmm. you you may have a, a pasta dish, but it's smaller. You'd also be having some protein. You would definitely be having some vegetables. You'd be having mm-hmm. the olive oil. But mm-hmm. can I ask you something? You would also be having the bread. And if you try to have a Mediterranean diet for breakfast for yourself or your kids, I think about it all the time because I'm always looking for an option to upgrade my children's breakfast. It's bread. It's a yeah. croissant. It's yeah, toast yeah. Totally, with jam. Totally, totally, it's totally, like, I don't get totally. it. How can we get away with that? Is that really what we're supposed to be doing? No, 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 no. In fact, the number one killer uh, and the driver of all these hallmarks of aging and accelerated biological aging is starch and sugar. It is just the number one oh. thing. If you people want to take home one thing from this conversation, it's really dramatically cut down or cut out starch and sugar in your diet. That's flour okay. products. I, I got to be honest, doctor. And, I This morning, I gave my three kids bagels. With right. some protein, I like some peanut butter. Okay. Bagels, okay, protein, and okay. Chocolate milk. I mean, so oh, sugar. No, chocolate milk. And I did. Megan. You know, we're trying to get them to drink milk, but we want them to drink milk, and they won't drink it unless we like make it a little sweeter. It's bad, bad. I violated all the rules. I, but oh. I don't. You can't give them eggs every day. No, not there's other things in eggs, but but what's interesting is is uh, the the. Uh, the amount of, of sugar we eat is so enormous and it is it is driving so much of the problem and the you know the the bread issue is interesting because i i was in Nicaria and uh i had bread and there was this guy who made bread the traditional way it was zaya flour zaya is a form of ancient wheat and it's it's actually a a wheat that was eaten by alexander the great that fueled his his adventures and conquests mm. it's super high in protein it's very low in the glycemic index very low in gluten full of minerals mm. uh and it's raised and cooked in rate and it's, it's it's raised in ways that you know keep its integrity in terms of its nutritional density and when they prepare the bread it's it's super dense so you know it's it's um you know something like that is a very different food than the kind of fluffy white breads we get here that are from mm. dwarf wheat that are super high in starch. I mean, it's 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 really bad. So I think you know if you're having traditional foods, a little bit of probably bread and in a traditional way is, is okay. But it's it's with everything else we're doing, it's it's sixty percent of our diet is ultra processed food. We eat one hundred and fifty two pounds of sugar and one hundred and thirty three pounds of flour per person a day. That's just an enormous amount. So that's the problem. My God, when you think about, um, like, I'm fine, obviously. I, I watch my sugar. I, I don't have a lot of sugar. But with the kids, you know, it's it's foisted on them all day, every day, right? You go to school, it's like the snack is some sort of cookie. And then it's somebody's it birthday, so everybody has a cupcake. And you're not going to be the mom who's like, don't touch that cupcake. Don't have that cookie. <laughs> and then they come home and they want they want a snack. And it's like, oh, one of those, like, little snack packs that has a little, a few M&Ms in it. And if you, like, just it's everywhere. And then they always want yeah. dessert, right? So it's like, it's just foisted on them. And if you look at what's actually recommended for the children in terms of sugar grams versus what they take in, it's horrifying. I know. I know. It's pretty, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. I I, I think, you know, we're, 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 we really have to sort of reset 
what we think of as okay. And I think uh, we're we're 93% of us, a little more than 93% of us in America are metabolically unhealthy. What that means is we have some form of prediabetes, uh, balances and imbalances in our blood sugar and insulin, which is driving aging. And that manifests as high blood sugar, high cholesterol, high blood sh- pressure, uh, being overweight or having had a heart attack or stroke. And those are not things that we should be thinking about as normal. And it's just because 93% of us are having it. It doesn't mean that it's okay. It means it's because yeah. our diet in America is is so deadly and costly. Mm. All right. So by the way, could you list a couple of the blue zones for us? Where, where are these? Yes. Yeah, so so I, I went to, a, I went to a, uh, three. Places. I was in in Sardinia in, in, uh, in where they had the longest of males in the world. There was a couple there that was collectively 210 years old. <laughs> it was very impressive. There was uh, Ikaria, which is in Greece. Uh, Okinawa in Japan, uh, uh, Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, which I've been at, and then uh, Loma Linda in uh, California, where the Seventh Day Adventists live. You mentioned, oh, that's what uh, Dr. Ben Carson is. Uh, You mentioned mentioned fish. Okay, now fish has a sketchy record, at least here in America, right? And and if you read, I love Dr. Marxist, and I read his book, you know, fish, it's got all this mercury in it. it. I do wonder... and I yeah. don't eat fish, to be perfectly honest, but I'm trying to eat more of it because I know it has some benefits. And yet I don't know what kind of fish to eat because I don't want all that mercury in me. You, you know, uh, So right. what do you do about fish? You're right. I mean, the fish doesn't have mercury originally. It's because we yeah, polluted the earth with coal-burning <laughs> uh, plants that spew out mercury and lead in the atmosphere yeah. that goes in the oceans that then the little fish eat the algae that take up the mercury then then it goes up the food chain so when you're eating big fish like tuna and swordfish halibut chilean sea bass these are just full of mercury and there are guides on how to choose fish that are lower in mercury like sardines herring mackerel anchovies some small wild salmon um and it's it's a problem so fish as a protein is great absent the mercury. So I agree. It's really a big issue. I think most people don't understand how bad these toxins are for them and how much they accumulate over time. And and I personally had mercury poisoning. That's how I kind of figured a lot of this out. Oh. But mm. but there are actually uh, some interesting new companies out there. One of them is called Cetopia.fish that, that actually sources regenerally raised aquaculture fish. It's low in toxins, it tastes delicious, it's raised in sustainable, regenerative ways. So I think there are pockets of where you can find it, but it's it's not easy. Is it better to just have chicken? (laughs) Just have beef? Like it's not that (laughs) hard to find those. Ideally, ideally, and this is not affordable for everybody, but I think ideally having uh, animals that are properly raised in ways that are good for them, good for the planet, and produce animal protein that's better for us. Uh is ideal. So uh, pasture-raised chicken, regenerally raised beef or bison or lamb, uh, all, all all fine. I think I think we don't um, have easy access to that. And I think there's more and more uh, investment in this. The $20 billion out of the IRA bill went towards uh, increasing regenerative agriculture and farmers. So we're seeing kind of a movement towards this. It's just, just going to take a little while till it becomes affordable. But I think that's, that's much healthier than eating uh, starch and sugar for sure. I mean, if Can I you expand on what a, you just said about the beef? Steak. I mean, what what we what we've been told is get the grass fed beef, get the organic yeah. beef if you can. Yeah. You're saying a different yeah. word. Regenerative, right? So regenerative is like next step than grass fed. So I can eat grass if it's only eating like one kind of grass. That's one thing. But if it's helping to restore a whole ecosystem by grazing on many, many hundred different plants and being left to graze in ways that restore the soil by moving the animals around a particular way. It actually helps to draw carbon out of the environment. It helps to restore uh, the diver- biodiversity uh, in farms, which we've lost because of all the chemical agriculture. And it produces food that's way more nutrient dense. It produces animal food that's much higher in omega-3 fats, much higher in minerals, antioxidants, and and much less inflammatory and probably anti-inflammatory mm-hmm. compared to traditional meat. So where do you the, get those? The, you can get it through online places now a lot, like Butcher Box, uh, Force of Nature. You can go uh, North Star Bison. You can get, you know, for example, I have elk and bison and venison and uh, and regenerally raised beef, and and it's really uh, more and more widely available. And you can buy it without going through the middleman, so it's a little cheaper directly from the the ranches, which I like. Mm-hmm. I know that you uh, believe in the theory of again, it's not your your uh, phrase, but you believe in the the theory of eat eat uh, fresh food, uh, not yeah. too much of it, 
mostly plants. I yes, can't remember Michael Pollan. Eat, eat, eat Michael Pollan. Eat food, not too much. Mostly plants. I, yes, basically, yeah. I agree. I think mostly plants. Food, so, but you're not you're not a vegan person. You're not you're not pushing veganism. No, I think in the longevity field, there's a lot of people who are you know advocating for a vegan diet because they believe it it's going to extend their life. But the problem with that is, is if you're only vegan and don't eat any meat, then you're and not actually building muscle the way you need to as you get older. And one of the things that happens is we start to lose muscle in our 30s and 40s, and we become, even if we don't become overweight, we become over fat, and our muscle becomes marbled, and then it turns into a metabolic chaos. So it slows okay. our metabolism, makes us pre-diabetic, it causes inflammation, it lowers our sex hormones, it lowers our growth hormone, increases stress hormones. So your muscle becomes a, really a source of aging. Healthy muscle and enough muscle is the key to longevity. And the way to get that is by having the right kinds of protein at the right time, and also by strength training or resistance training. It could be bands, it could be weights, it could be body weight, but it's super important to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we got to get into what should we do? What should we eat? How often should we exercise? How should we exercise? And is there any magic supplement? Is it collagen? Is, it, is there some pill? Is there something else we should be doing to update our routine so that we can work on our internal longevity and wellness. That, I'll pause it there. We'll take a quick break and we will come back with more with the great Dr. Mark Hyman in just a moment. That This is an exciting thought, guys. We're helping you live forever today uh, or at least forever young. One of our sponsors today is Donors Trust, the principled tax-friendly way to simplify your charitable giving. Love what they do. Listen to this. Cancel culture, as you know, does not just affect comedians and commentators anymore. It also affects everyday, hardworking, regular old Americans who are just trying to mind their own business. How so? Well, it can derail their charitable giving. This is sick, but it's happening. Take Jeannie's story, all right? Jeannie did her charitable giving through one of the big national donor-advised fund providers. That is, until without a clear reason, it refused to send her charitable dollars to a conservative nonprofit. Jeannie writes, I'm a conservative. I believe America's great despite her imperfections and that capitalism brings great good to society rather than government. Earlier this year, I requested another gift from my donor-advised fund and it was rejected. Jeannie wanted a donor-advised fund that shares her conservative principles and she found it in Donors Trust, the oldest and largest donor-advised fund committed to limited government. Do you want a principled partner helping you support causes close to your heart? If so, consider opening a donor-advised fund with Donors Trust. For more info on how Donors Trust can help, visit donorstrust.org mk to receive a free copy of their donor prospectus. That's D-O-N-O-R-S trust.org slash mk. So tell us all how. What exactly do we need to do? One of the things I, I was asking myself as I listened was you were talking about the panoply of, you know, color that we get from the rainbow mm -hmm. and we should look for in our veggies and our fruits. And all I could think of was Tom Brady, who avoids the root vegetables. And because whenever yeah. I have like an eggplant or a tomato, I'm like, oh, God, Tom Brady would tell me I shouldn't be yeah. having this. And he looks yeah, too young yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah. Is it true? <laughs> what's, what's the story on vegetables and fruits? Oh boy. Okay. So uh, this is a really interesting conversation. And there's there are some people who are sensitive to certain components in foods like lectins and things, which are found in you know the nightshade vegetables, uh, eggplant, tomatoes, nightshade. peppers, potatoes. Those those are the things that Tom Brady was talking about. And they, they can be inflammatory. And so the only way to know is eliminate, eliminate them and see how you do. But the truth is plants are full of these powerful compounds called phytochemicals. Now, the plant is not making them for us. They're the plant's own defense systems, their own immune system, their own deterrence. They're like little poisons, really. But what's happened is we've co-evolved with these plants. And so when we eat them in the right amounts, it actually is like a mini stress to our body, but it activates these healing systems. So, you know, we, we sort of touched on the hallmarks of aging, but the body has these incredible systems, these longevity pathways, these longevity switches, that if you stimulate them in the right way with some of these plant compounds, these phytonutrients, it actually extends your life. It reverses aging. It actually reverses disease and reduces things like inflammation and so forth. So for example, uh, fysetin is a compound in strawberries that activates uh, a pathway that kills the zombie cells in our body. Zombie cells are cells that should die, but don't die. And then they go around spewing inflammation, causing havoc and creating a mess oh. for you and accelerating aging. Or oh. for example, 
uh, compounds like a green tea, the catechins in green tea stimulate other longevity switches that reduce inflammation and help DNA repair and do all kinds of amazing things. So we can start to include things like curcumin, the broccoli family, and quercetin, which is in onions and 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 garlic and and apples. And uh, these bare powerful plant compounds are available to us in what we're eating that can transform our health in a positive way. So, mm. you know, we do, we do, you know, we don't want to eat uh, certain foods that are potentially inflammatory for us, but most, most of the people do great with all the vegetables. Okay. And I, all and right, I here's, think here's me wet blanket again. Them, and we don't this, need this enough is, this of This is the mercury <laughs> fish question on the vegetables. What about okay. the pesticides? Because I know, right. I, yes. and this is back to Mark Sisson. He said, okay, be careful because like all the pesticides on the vegetables, you know, they could be a problem. So he's like, yes. you know, buy local. Well, I'm in Connecticut. You would think it'd be easy to find a farm. I went all over. I looked high and low really? for like an actual farm that I could buy, you know, unpesticided vegetables from. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't yeah. find one. So finally, like in the nicer months, you can go to the farmer's market. Let's be honest. I've been going to Whole Foods. You have to pay an arm and a leg and you get the stuff that they say is organic, but it's not It's not from the farm. And I'm telling you, getting right. the stuff from the farm is a lot harder than, than they make it out to be. It so is, what, yeah. what about the pesticides? I mean, there's actually some great resource online for community support agriculture and, and ways to sort of get inexpensive organic vegetables. There's, there's a great uh, companies that are now offering kind of ugly vegetables that that oh. people throw out because the farmers throw out because people want perfectly shaped vegetables but that are organic and are cheaper so there's ways to do it um but the truth is that that yes the way we grow our food is terrible and it's destroying us the planet the soil yeah. <laughs> the biodiversity there are there are guides to eating foods with less pesticides or no pesticides so i'm on the board of the environmental working group and they have a guide called the dirty dozen and the clean 15. The dirty dozen are the 12 most contaminated fruits and vegetables that you should never consume unless they're organic. The oh. dirty, the clean 15 are things like, oh, well, if I eat or avocados or bananas or whatever, not so bad. So I don't have to buy organic of those, but I can buy organic strawberries if I want to eat strawberries because those are the worst, yeah. for example. Yes, so, I've heard that. You no, know, it's just about uh, making sure you either don't eat the ones that are the most contaminated or if you can buy organic and focus on the ones that are the, the least contaminated. Okay. I, I would like it noted for the record that I did provide the children with strawberries. Everybody also had that this morning, just for the record. Just so, okay, so good, no. good, good. <laughs> I'm gonna, what, can, I, can we spend a minute on breakfast though? Because I find incorporating yes. protein into lunch and dinner, because I know you, as we discussed, you're pro-protein. Um, yes. That's very easy. Breakfast, it's not as easy. Um, yeah. You've got the eggs, yes. You've got potentially the yep. yogurt. Um, what else, yeah. what else, what, what are we supposed to be eating for breakfast? Yeah, great, great question. So uh, let me talk about why, because I think, you know, we basically eat sugar for breakfast in America. We have cereals, yeah, we muffins, bagels, uh, croissants, we have French toast, pancakes. I mean, the list goes on and on oatmeal. We basically eat sugar for breakfast. And this is the absolute worst thing you do for your health because it activates high levels of insulin. Insulin makes you store belly fat. It makes you hungry. It causes diabetes, fatty liver, screws up your cholesterol, makes you age mm. faster, lowers your sex drive, all kinds of stuff, right? Makes God. you lose your hair. It's terrible. And <laughs> and and the key to longevity is to eat after a 12 to ideally 14-hour overnight fast, meaning you eat dinner at 6, breakfast at 8. That's 14 hours of not eating. That's really important to let your body do a self-cleaning and repair system, which is called autophagy. That's a key part of the longevity strategy we talked about in the book. Mm. Then when you're in that fasted state in the morning, you want to have a good load of protein. And the reason is you want to activate muscle synthesis because having the right protein in the morning is the best way to actually trigger your body Body to make more muscle and to improve your metabolism. So what should you eat? Well, like you said, you can have eggs and omelet. You can have, so for example, maybe a Greek yogurt, which is maybe higher in protein. You can add nuts in there. You can add seeds in there. Uh, there's ways you can even mix in a little protein powder in some of that. Uh, I like I like to have a shake. Your kids would probably love this for breakfast, like almost like a milkshake, but it's made with the uh, whey protein. So you can get, I like to use goat whey because it's less inflammatory and you can get regeneratively raised goat whey. You can buy a big container of it and it lasts a long time. And, uh, and that you can mix in uh, berries, you can mix in nut butters, you can mix in other things to enhance it as well. 
Um, and that that actually is a great way to and put in some like a nut milk, like a cashew milk or macadamia milk or almond milk, but unsweetened, <laughs> not oat milk because mm-hmm. oat milk's very sugary. Um, macadamia is probably the lowest. And then you can just have that for a great shake. That's what I do. It's called my healthy aging shake. I have it in the book, the recipe. I add a few extra things in there, but it's a great way to start the day and, and breakfast. Sometimes, you know, like in other countries, they have fish for breakfast, like lox, right? <laughs> Sard oh, yeah, herring, right. you know, like- On the like Upper kipper, West Side, we kipper, had that. <laughs> kippers, you know. So I, I can have that for breakfast, you know, you can, <laughs> that's fine too. It was like, I'll have for breakfast, like a, a can of kippers with uh, tomatoes and avocado and some, you know, just- some lemon juice on it and it's delicious. Okay. All right. Okay. So that we like protein, we like vegetables. We, we are pro fruit too. I mean, fruit sometimes gets a bad name, right? Because of the sugar, but are you pro fruit? I'm definitely pro fruit. I think, I think it should not be a, like the staple of your diet because if you pick, if you're, if you look at America, like I said, 93% of us are in some range of pre-diabetes to diabetes or poor metabolic health. And, and that is made worse by sugar. So if you have it on an empty stomach, not great. So having it with food, like if you're having yogurt and you want to put nuts in there and you want to add some fruit, great. If you want to have a smoothie mm. with whey protein, maybe a little avocado in there and you throw in and some nuts for fat and then you put in some fruit, no problem. Um, mm. I think you want to uh, enjoy fruit and have low glycemic fruit like berries. But if you're having a ton of grapes or, uh, you know, a a ton of pineapple or, you know, that can actually be pretty sugary. So, you know, now we actually have uh, the ability to do glucose monitoring. We can take a little device yes. put on our arm and we can measure what happens. So everybody's different. Like some people, some people eat pineapple and they're fine. Other people eat pineapple and their sugar will go through the roof. So it's about identifying what works for you and what doesn't work for you. So Dr. Peter Atia was big on this, on this glucose monitoring thing, but I, I remain unclear on how regular gen pop people can get this. Like, do we, do we need a you? Yeah. Do we need a Dr. Atia? No, 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 no. We get no, this no. at the CVS. No, no, you can get it. Uh, there's actually a company I'm an a cons- uh, advisor for called Levels Health. And uh, you can go to, I think, Levels, uh, just Google Levels Health and you'll find the yeah. link and you can sign up and get the device delivered to you. It's a little device you apply. It's very easy to apply. It hooks up to your phone and you can follow your app and you can track your sugars and you can see what's happening. And it's fascinating. I actually learned a lot. I mean, I I eat pretty healthy, but sometimes I overeat. Like I was at a friend's house and and uh, in the summer and they ordered this incredible spread from this, you know, organic like restaurant farm to table and like this huge lamb and tons of veggies. And they had some, you know, such sweet potatoes, lots of stuff. And I ate way too much food. And both of us had the monitor on. We literally just put it on. Our sugars went like to 150. Like, what is going on? So it's not just the kind of food. It's the amount of food. So if you overeat, it also can cause a problem. So. Yes, remember that that piece of the principle. Eat food, not too much. Not too much. Yeah. You really have to yeah. rein it in. Yeah. We don't need nearly as much as we tend to eat. All right, so exercise. This is the sad part of the MK story. You need to exercise <laughs> You need weight resistance, you said, right? So to build up your muscle. But like, yeah. what's the bare minimum we need to be doing? We have to do it. We must do it starting today, this week. No no longer postponing. What do we have to do? You know, it doesn't have to be that much, turns out. Um, it, it It's about 30 minutes, three times a week. And if you can do um, strength training, it can be body weight. It can be bands, which I do. It can be weights. There's lots of ways to do it. But it's one of those things that, that's, that, that we all kind of try to avoid, but actually turns out is, is the most important thing to maintain muscle and to build muscle as we get older. Because the thing that keeps us, you know, not being at our full sort of speed as we get older is we've just become weaker. We can't open jars. We can't get up out of a chair. We can't kind of mm. do the normal functional things we want to do. So think about like, how would you train to be a hundred year old uh that's able to do all these things. Well, you have to keep and build your muscle. Like my father to start now was, in his seventies was, you know, we went skiing, he fell and he couldn't get up, <laughs> you know, that's not, mm-hmm. not a good thing. So I, you know, then in his eighties, he was kind of even dwindling more in his kind of mid to late eighties. I said, dad, you know, how about we get you a trainer? And so it was my birthday present. He got a trainer and at 88 years old, he was in the gym lifting weights with the trainer. And then he was able to play tennis with me at 89 and was like, oh, wow. It was, pre- it was pretty impressive to see. Even so it's at never too late. late. No. All right. So what now? What else? Is there something else we should be thinking of? Is there some pill we need to take, a supplement yes, well, the, in addition yeah, to all there this is, stuff? There is some other cool stuff that I 
write about in the book um that it's uh, accessible and affordable to all of us and and that's called hormesis now hormesis is a big word essentially it means a stress that doesn't kill you that makes you stronger so right now we live lives of comfort we have food available 24 7. it's a stress that doesn't kill us that makes us stronger it's not eating overnight, which is a form of starvation. It's using your body and exercising and build resistance where you carry your muscle fibers, but they come back stronger. It's doing hot and cold therapy, like a sauna or a hot bath or a cold shower or a cold plunge. They activate these ancient healing systems in our body that are so necessary. So those are really cool things we can all do every day. And then, you know, there's some other things that, you know, we can take as supplements, which are these little stressors we talked about. And I, I take a, a, a basic a routine of supplements that I talk about in my book, Young Forever, a multivitamin, fish oil, vitamin D. And then I add some other things like NMN, which people might've heard about, or NAD, which helps activate some of these longevity pathways. I take a bunch of phytochemicals like green tea, quercetin. I take extract from strawberry called Fyseed, and I take a derivative from pomegranate. And these are things that help from the science actually change our biology to make us younger. Can I ask you something? I just recently started taking some of these supplements. I had to take calcium because, you know, my old lady bones and uh, fish oils because I don't eat fish, that kind of But I'm starting already to look like my, you know, 82-year-old mother with my pills set up. I was like, I got to bake in an extra 10 minutes for your pill cycle at the end of the day. Are you doing that? Is there some short-form way of getting all this stuff? I mean, you can, there's powders, you can mix it in smoothies, but, you know, at the end of the day, you got to take a few things. And the reason is we live in in an environment that was very unlike the one we evolved in and our nutrients and our food are much more depleted. We're not getting all the nutrients we need. Nutritional deficiencies like vitamin D, omega-3s, some of the B vitamins, magnesium, zinc, iron. We're so deficient in these across our across our population. And they're necessary mm-hmm. for all the functions in our body. So we have to take them. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we have to do that. All of this is in your book. So if people want to know exactly what are the supplements that you take, <laughs> what are some good recipes, they're That's in right. here. They're in, they're in Young Forever. You don't have to squeeze it all in in this hour. These are just sort of tips for you on the things you need to be thinking about. And then the specifics on how to actually execute are all in the book. So for people who are sitting there right now saying, I, I'm going to change one thing. That's all I'm changing. I'm, you know, I'm setting my ways. I like my lifestyle. I'm going to be realistic. What is the one thing they need to do? Well, I'm going to cheat and give you a, like a very condensed version of the, the two most important things. One is take that. cut out ultra processed foods and refined sugars and starches. And two, add protein in the morning and do a little resistance training three times a week. And if you do that, you're like 80% of the way there. <laughs> My God. And didn't you also say in the book that even just a 20 minute walk a few times a week can make a yeah. real difference? Well, that's the thing. If you're sedentary, the biggest gains in terms of Uh, health benefits are from doing nothing to walking 20 to 30 minutes a day. Like that adds so much in terms of longevity, health, disease, dementia, heart disease, cancer, diabetes. It's really impressive. So you don't have to kill yourself. Just do something. Mm -hmm, Good. And that gets you outside and maybe makes you more social. That's one of the benefits of having a dog or two in my case is they make you get a little bit more social, which is also good for you. Back to the Nana story. Uh, All of this is in Mark's book, who's doing great, great work on keeping us all living to 120 and living well all the way there. Thank you so much. It's great to see you. Good to see you. (laughs) All right. Don't forget, the book is called Young Forever, The Secrets to Living Your Longest, Healthiest Life. We're going to be right back with our culture warriors, and you're going to love seeing Carrie and Britt again. Don't go away. Going to bed at a decent hour did not always mean I got enough sleep. Maybe you can relate. Oftentimes, I was too hot or too cold or just not comfy. Well, that changed thanks to my cozy earth bedding, the softest, most luxurious, and responsibly sourced bedding on the planet. Cozy earth bedding is naturally temperature regulating, so I sleep great in any weather. And I'm not alone. Laura, she left this five-star review, quote, my husband and I are getting the best sleep we've ever had, to the point where we don't wake up in the middle of the night because we're so comfortable. I can't wait to buy more colors, end quote. Cozy Earth Bedding is made from the finest materials, including premium viscose made from highly sustainable bamboo. Whether it's their luxury sheets, available in five beautiful colors, their loungewear, pajamas, or their premium waffle bath towels, you're going to love shopping at Cozy Earth. Hurry, save 35% right now on Cozy Earth. Go to CozyEarth.com, enter my promo code Megan, M-E-G-Y-N, and save 35% off your order. CozyEarth.com, promo code M-E-G-Y-N. 
Today, we have an all-star culture panel with two former pageant queens and moms who are working to create a more sane country for our children. Carrie Prejean and Britt Mayer recently launched a new project called The Battle Cry to further their efforts. You've been listening to them come on our show for a while. Now they are actually making something official to try to give other people a way of speaking out to join them in their fight for sanity. And they join us today to discuss some of their biggest issues. Um, we got it all covered. Stand by. Welcome back to the show, ladies. Thank you for Hi, having Megan. us. It's great to have you. Okay, so there's so much to go over, and I, I'm excited about your— I like I like the battle cry. That's good. That, that works mm-hmm. for both of you. And I like <laughs> that you're giving other people a place to go, who are moms or dads or anybody who wants to sort of pitch in but has no idea where to start. So we'll talk about that in one second. Um, we got to begin with Don Lemon. We got to start with him because he's back on the air today. You women are women who fight for other women, uh, biological women, mm-hmm. <laughs> actual women, uh, and women's spaces and so on. So this is why Don Lemon's in the news this week and last because he took a shot at Nikki Haley suggesting women are past their prime once they're over age 40. Uh, it was not the first, and I guarantee you it won't be the last, of his sexist comments, and this is why it became such a big deal. Nobody— gets nobody who's sane or on the right or opposed to cancel culture gets all up in somebody's grill over one comment in our in our country. Uh, that's something the left does. But when there is a repeated pattern and it's very clear a guy's a sexist and he has a national post and he's in the midst of bullying his co-hosts who are female and younger, he deserves to have it shoved down his throat. So that's where we come in. <laughs> so he co- he comes on the air today. He made the comments about Nikki Haley on the air last week, last Wednesday, I think it was. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have the balls to mm-hmm. issue an on-air apology. He's got to issue a tweet before he goes on the set because he's a coward and can't issue the apology. The rule in journalism typically is you issue the apology in the same format and with the same audience in which you delivered the sin, in which you, in which you committed the sin, right? Mm-hmm. If you said it on the air, that's where the apology goes. Nope. It was a Twitter apology that reads as follows before he hit the air. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be back on CNN this morning today. To my network, my colleagues, and our incredible audience, I'm sorry. I've heard you. I'm learning from you. And I'm committed to doing better. See you soon. This is we hear that his boss, Chris Licht, has decided on a, quote, I think it's formal training (laughs) that's now going to, like, deprogram him as a sexist. Is yeah. it worked so well for like Jeff Zucker and Chris Cuomo and Jeffrey mm-hmm. Tubin? I don't know what kind of program they have over there, but it hasn't done such a bang up job on their no. on air or behind the scenes male personalities. So what do you ladies make of the CNN decision to tweet the apology, put him right back on the air and off he goes covering Nikki Haley and other women? Yeah, that's called liberal privilege right there. I mean, if it was any conservative, could you imagine if Sean Hannity said that, Megan? Oh, my God. I mean, what About would happen to him? Kamala Harris? Tucker. Tucker. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. And to point out his apology, he starts with saying, to my network. Why didn't he start with, to women everywhere, who I have... And Nikki Haley. Friend. Yeah, to Nikki Haley, you know? And so he he... He deserves, you know, to be let go. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm not about cancel culture. I was canceled. But in this situation, we'd like to invite him over to Battle Cry. And we'd like to have him do some training with us. We'll, <laughs> we'll put him into shape. <laughs> we'll him I into shape. love that idea. Yes, that's, That training I would trust, Carrie. Yes. <laughs> that, yes. that I could get behind. Britt, yes. what do you make of it? Well, what I notice is the my mama always taught me that when we apologized, we had to explicitly apologize for what? Like, what are you sorry for? So if you slug your brother, you can't just say, I'm sorry. Like you had to say, I'm sorry, I hit you, I won't do it again. And then you do something kind in to counterbalance what you did that was mean. Um, so my first reaction is like, you're sorry for what, Don? Like you, you didn't even explain what you did. It was just a one-off, like, sorry, I have to say this just so that I can Mm -hmm. get back to my job. So it reads totally insincere. And like Carrie said, it wasn't directed at the person that he initially directed his comment to. So it's just, it's, it read extremely insincere and it's not surprising. I think it's interesting. I didn't know until this morning because I was like, you know, how old is Don Lemon? Um, So he's 56. Nikki yep. is 51. And then you have Biden, who is 80. So 
Yeah. You know, well, even Whoopi like Goldberg was out there saying the the whole she's not a new thing. generation. It's like, well, she is compared to Biden and Trump. That's that's the point that she was saying people over 75 in politics should take a mental competency exam. That's why we this whole topic got injected into the national conversation. She is a new generation. She's literally a different generation than mm-hmm. Biden and Trump. Um, so here's the thing. Can I can I tell you this? The thing about Don Lemon that has been bothering me among others, his repeated sexism, number one. But number two is this guy has pretended to be the moral arbiter of us all for the past five years. And I remembered this one particular example in particular that I want to show you. And then I have some others. Um, But do you remember when Chris Harrison, longtime host of The Bachelor, Uh, got fired over this bullshit incident where a, a contestant on The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, whatever, had been outed as having a few years earlier in 2018 gone to an, an antebellum party celebrating yeah. the old Deep Remember South. Remember that. Yeah. Okay. So it came out like she, this was like five years earlier, four years earlier, whatever it was, yeah. a couple years earlier. Um, but it was 2018 that she was, that the pictures were taken. And she was apologizing. I'm sorry. You're not allowed to celebrate the South, you know, given its history. And Chris Harrison, it wasn't his controversy. He didn't mm-hmm. He didn't go to the party. But he said something about cancel culture because she was having the wolves come down on her and saying, she said she's sorry, you know, it was a few years ago, like, can't show her any grace. Cancel culture, you know, it's kind of getting out of hand. He was canceled. The mm-hmm. lo- Everybody loved that him, loved it. He's like to- totally vanilla. This guy is not yeah. controversial. No. And he, so like, if you're going to get mad about anybody, you're going to get mad at Chris Harrison. Like, he doesn't inspire the ire of most normal people. And Don Lemon gave him absolutely no grace. We mm. pulled the interview from the night Don Lemon covered this Ooh. with one, a contestant who was on the— I, I, Forgive me, I actually don't know the other woman. She was either a journalist or a contestant. But he's doing an interview with somebody about the issue. And here he is talking about Chris Harrison and his apology. Why do you think Chris Harrison was willing to give Rachel Kirkconnell so much room for her hurtful actions, yet couldn't muster an empathy towards communities of color? I don't know if these apologies are sincere or what have you. Chris has been on this earth for five decades. He hasn't had to deal with these issues. He hasn't taken the opportunity or the chance in almost 50 years, especially doing what he does in the history of this show, to learn about racism in America, that's actually the definition of privilege. Because he kept talking about the woke police and, and all of this. And, yeah. and we know that terminology is used by people who want to be able to say and do racist things. My God. <laughs> Does he even hear, like, I wonder if he would even hear himself if he listened to that clip you just played, which I hope you are, Don. I know. I, Post that I wonder, ish. would he, would <laughs> oh, he he'll hear it. what we just saw? Or is he so narcissistic that it would be way over his head? Can you, I mean, it's dead on. If you just substitute in yeah. women and sexism for the mm-hmm. racism, right? Where's your empathy, where's your empathy, Don, for women? Where's your empathy for us? Yeah. You've been on this earth for five decades. Mm-hmm. Haven't you learned by this point what makes a sexist and what doesn't? Uh, where I, too, question the sincerity of your apology, right? Like, all yeah. the things. This is how Don Lemon reacts when mm-hmm. somebody comes under fire, whenever it comes to race, right? That's his now, that's his new issue. He stumbled on it within the past five years. He m- used to sound more like Bill Cosby. Pull your pants up. Stop it. Yeah. Now he went totally woke. And now he's got to be the moral arbiter on race, on many things, in fact. And here, if you don't believe the Chris Harrison example, is a little montage of how he has sounded about our country and prominent figures in it over the past five years. And it's yet another example of why he doesn't deserve the grace of anybody right now. He's never afforded it to anyone. Here he is. This is CNN Tonight. I'm Don Lemon. The president of the United States is racist. His supporters made excuses, continue to make excuses for him. What does it say about you that no matter what, no matter what, you continue to make excuses for this man, for his vile behavior, this sort of vile behavior? 
I want to hear now hard. to the co-workers, to the people of color you work with on this network every no single day color, God, who are offended by your remark. Stop You're not it. listening to Sounds us. Like Sharon Osbourne having it out with her co-host following Piers Morgan's attacks on the Duchess of Sussex. If she apologized, I'm sorry, whatever, that's fine. I didn't see a, hey, Sure, Underwood, I'm sorry for the way I treated you, how I spoke to you, that I disrespected you on national television. I didn't see that at all. And the, you know when an apology is sincere, right? That was not sincere. And she didn't apologize to the right people. Oh, my, <laughs> my God. God. Jerry, oh, my God. Yeah. It's unbelievable. What a uh -huh. hypocrite. Oh, my goodness. And you know what? I think this is what bothers me, Megan is where is Nikki Haley right now? Like, why isn't Nikki Haley punching back for all women saying, absolutely not, will you disrespect me like this? Why aren't you mm -hmm. talking about Joe Biden's prime? Where, yeah, or, right, or exactly. Don's prime. When was he in his prime? I don't even think he ever had a prime. <laughs> there was no prime. There, there was, was no a brief prime. prime in the prime time and it ended yeah. quickly. <laughs> yeah, no. It, uh, it's, no, it's, it's unbelievable. Not. Like all the things, in the, including what you just said, Carrie, where yeah. he- um, you know, they, there was no specific apology, right? It, he didn't get, and what or you said, Britt, right? Like, he didn't mm -hmm. apologize to any specific group. That's what mm -hmm. he's mad about. He's teaching yeah. us how to do the apology. Why didn't we hear that, Don, in your stupid, feckless tweet? We didn't mm -hmm. even get yeah. an on-air version of your stupid tweet. Never mind a specific, hey, Nikki Haley, I'm sorry, yeah. women of the world, I'm sorry. And then going on talking about, they're making excuses. What does it say? Those who make excuses Oh, meanwhile, he's going with the, some of my best friends are women defense. That's an excuse, Don. Mm -hmm. I was inartful. That's an excuse. Yeah. And yeah. talking about what was most important to him. People are offended. They're offended. Speak to their offense. Hello, preacher, heal thyself. You've offended more than half America with your inane, yeah. dumbass, sexist comments. Speak yeah. to us. And not in a stupid tweet. Oh, never mind, because we won't believe you anyway at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I think he views himself as a protected class. Mm -hmm. And so he can do no wrong. And that's showing. And honestly, I think that's going to be his downfall. It's his hubris. It makes him so untrustworthy and so duplicitous that it makes him irrelevant. Like, I have no desire if I ever did want to watch him. Seeing that that you just showed is so sobering because it shows that he's he's a hypocrite and yeah, he yeah, thinks he's totally. so protected that he is like God. He's a narcissist. And yeah. so I think that is what will make him um, irrelevant. You're right, Britt. And can I tell you, so CNN has supported him all these years. They've allowed him to go on the air and spew that hate and pro-cancel, you know, people like Chris Harrison and ruin the ruination of people's careers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no quarter for anybody like a Sharon Osbourne. What Sharon Osbourne did? A absolutely nothing. She did absolutely nothing wrong. Um, but he he wants to go out there and excoriate her and make her apologize for what? She was attacked by her co-host. That's what happened to her for, for having the nerve to say, Piers Morgan's allowed to have an opinion about Meghan Markle. By the way, Piers Morgan was 100% right about his opinion on Meghan Markle. Um, so <laughs> for, for years now, CNN has been supporting this messaging of his. Absolutely yeah. no grace for anybody. And now when he's got his 25th offense, right? If you want to go down the lane of stupidity, we're much higher than that. But on sexist comments, there's a long list. And I, I don't say everything he said. Like, he got in trouble for saying people want to watch men's sports more than they want to watch women's. That's that's why the men get paid. I actually didn't find that particularly sexist. I have to be honest. I don't include that in the list. Mm -hmm. I, I've only zeroed in on the ones that are very obvious. They're on the damn nose. Mm -hmm. And this is why CNN is on the hook. You have him out there yeah. with, a, with a blowtorch every yeah. night for five years, and then he steps in it repeatedly, and you want us to forgive him? Why should we? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it was Charlie Kirk recently. I think it was yesterday where he tw he he tweeted something that said it was so powerful. It was like, and I'm paraphrasing, but something along the lines of like, are we back to protecting women? Like, or have the mm -hmm. feminists completely like disregarded women altogether? Because I feel like that's mm -hmm. where we're at. That's why Don got away with this. The feminists, they're not pissed off about this. You they're they're oddly like, silent. You've got, like they're you've completely got normal silent. liberals. So this, these sexist comments, the only people that are offended by it are women, but the, the women are not speaking out. That's the problem. That's why we have to push back. Like, yeah. so here's the thing. You've got normal liberals who are mad. Like I cited some of them on the air yesterday and, they, and they've spoken up to their credit. Uh, and then you've got a group like Ultraviolet who they're, they're 
big in the Me Too movement and things like that. And they've, they've issued some sort of a statement. But oh, then here's what wow. happens, Carrie. But here's okay. what happens. They go totally silent. Yeah. They don't push it. They yeah. don't push it the way they would push it over a Tucker or a Sean Hannity or, you know, yeah. somebody who was on the right. Because you're right. He is in a protected yeah. class. A couple of them. Yeah. Why aren't they showing up at CNN with their pussy wearing hats, you know, yes. chanting women's lives Good question. matter? Like, <laughs> I, yeah. And you know what I want to know? I want to know if he had made those comments about a trans woman, mm. would he still be sitting right. there? Yes. Because right. what it really is revealing is, yes, he is the protected class, but it's showing who is okay to be the punching bag in society as well. Yes. And I can guarantee you, if those comments had been directed at a trans woman, there's no way. There is no way because it would have been virtue for CNN to have let him go. And they would have made a huge, it would have been a huge situation. But because it was about a woman, it's very irritating. And it shows you how backwards our society is. And it's really showing you how the power structures are um, are yes. being played out. Right. Yes, I said this on my show yesterday. Does does our offense matter? And it's not, mm-hmm. I'm not quick to get offended, truly. I mean, it takes a lot. Trust me, I'm Irish. Um, but well, all these people have been canceled because they caused offense. Chris Harrison is canceled because Don Lemon went on the air and excoriated him for causing offense. Actually, his offense was he wasn't offended enough by this woman's uh, you know, attendance at a a party, right? Mm-hmm. That was my offense at NBC too. I wasn't offended enough by the fact that people used to wear blackface costumes. Right? Like even the mere yeah. lack of offense can get you canceled. But for wit, when it comes to women, you yeah. can offend virtually all of us yeah. and yeah. it's fine. You can keep your job, no problem. You offend Don Lemon, you are fired. Your ass is fired. You offend Dylan Mulvaney, this trans oh. activist, your ass is fired. You mm-hmm. offend women. And I mean women from the left, women from the right, young women, old women. You're fine. You're good. Why Fair don't game. you just tweet something out? Fair no game. problem. Right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So sad. And it's it's frustrating. I mean, this there's is what no you guys consistency. Have That's the problem is, you know, there's no consistency across the board. If Sean Hannity said that, he'd be off the air today. Done. But Don Lennon would probably be on the air excoriating him. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But Don, he's got this liberal privilege that he can just offend Nikki Haley. Why doesn't he sit down with Nikki Haley and have a one-on-one discussion with her? How about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. did you guys catch too, like just to go into it a little bit, but when he said that she was past her prime and, you know, the co-hosts were clearly shocked. And then I think one of them asked like, well, what? how do you determine prime? And he cited Google. Google it. And he was like, well, you know, like Google. And this is like someone we're supposed to trust for our like news and information. No, like he's making himself completely irrelevant. But it is indicative of a cultural problem at large where you have protected classes and you have classes that are no longer protected and are the punching bag that are allowed. Um, And like Carrie just said, it's totally inconsistent. But I just thought it was hilarious that he cited you know, Google. The Google, the Google. Yeah. Well, that's why now it's gone past Don Lemon. Now this is about CNN. This is about mm-hmm. Chris Licht yes. and where he stands. This this stank wasn't on him until he decided to handle it this way. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, like hit, nobody believes in this fake re-education camp. He's not going to go be deprogrammed on his sexism. Please mm-hmm. spare me. And the same way he didn't believe anybody's apology, we don't believe his. So we'll see. I mean, if I were at CNN right now and I had any power whatsoever, like I did at Fox News, I would be in the boss's office saying, this is insane. You can't get away with this. This, The the way you're handling this is an affront to us all. And all the women anchors at CNN should be in the office today demanding action. Right. Shame on them. Right. Where are they? Why Shame haven't they said them. anything publicly? Like yeah. somebody should say something publicly. They're they all should covering say, their asses. I mean, Jake Tapper said something about Chris Cuomo when he crossed that ethical line to his credit, right? Yeah. He was like, that was not okay what he did. Um, why, where are the, where's Dana Bash, who Don yeah. Lemon cited as a friend? Let's hear you. Okay, let's hear what you have to say about your friend, yes. right? Somebody over there should stand up for his female co-host who he's bullying. They've said absolutely nothing. Absolutely or even nothing. ad partners, like ad partners, are they walking? Are they oh. pulling over it? Good question. You know, there's, there's so much power in supporting the narcissist. 
And he's only as powerful as the support and the protection he gets. So it's on everyone who's supporting this. His co-hosts, the CNN at large, and then any ad partners too. I mean, they're all complicit. If they're silent in this, their silence is complicit. And yes, it's not, didn't do anything violent, but it was extremely offensive. It was uneducated and it was very rude. And he Mm -hmm. didn't come out with a, a robust apology that read as, he was truly remorseful. And so no. for all of that mess, like for CNN to not make any sort of a public apology and then take him off of their platform for mm-hmm. ad partners to not pull and for the co host to not make public statements, I think it's an indication again of just like how backwards our society is. And hopefully, hopefully they'll hear this and they'll make changes. But right now it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good on CNN. Mm-hmm. No, it does not at all. No, I, it's, I mean, look, there's, they've got a lot of work to do over there with him, and it won't be long at all before something else comes out about Don Lemon. That's just who he is. Um, but good luck, CNN. Good luck dealing with that. Okay, speaking of trans women, um, <laughs> we've got to talk about this shop teacher up in Canada. I'm sorry, but it's getting even more bizarre. It, you guys know the story. So yeah. it, the, the, this, it's a biological man who goes by Kayla Lemieux. And uh, Kayla is up in Canada. And Kayla is the one who wears the enormous, fake, clearly prosthetic breasts with the clearly prosthetic, enormous nipples. Kayla looks absurd. No one is fooled that this is a woman. This is a biological man. Um, Kayla became a trans woman, I think, like 10 years ago, late in life, and teaches shop up in Canada with those enormous prosthetic breasts inches away from the saw machines. (laughs) From sudden death. It's not safe. It's not. <laughs> and now <laughs> Kayla is in the news because Kayla gave an interview to the New York Post. They have this exclusive interview with Kayla, and Kayla is denying that those are prosthetic breasts. <laughs> oh, give me a break. <laughs> no, no, That's, absolutely Kayla, not. No. Noting, these are real. This no. condition is classified as gigantomastia. <laughs> No. So now her now her tits identify as real. <laughs> you can't make this up. <laughs> no, it's a hard no on That's this. Hard Kayla no. says it's very rare. It's very oh. rare this condition. It affects women on a very rare basis. But in my case, um, I have now. Kayla's claiming to be intersex. That Kayla says oh. I have XX chromosomes as well as the XY, and. Hormone no. sensitivity to estrogen has caused it. No, I'm just going to go no, right out no, and say, no, no. this is a big lie. This lie is almost as big as those fake big boobs. <laughs> <laughs> this is not true. Oh my God. That's my opinion. <laughs> Don't believe you, Kayla. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wait, is this serious? Like this, the dude really yes. went on and had this interview? This and said this? This actually this happened. Like- and um, now there is an allegation that Kayla doesn't even wear her very real boobs when she is outside of the classroom. Oh, I did see that. The Post talks about how um, there was somebody photographed by the Post just last week driving out of Kayla's apartment building and walking on a sidewalk a short time later. That person who was dressed in men's clothing and did not have breasts, never mind gigantomastia breasts. Look at this. This is the split screen. Oh my God. There's a lot going on on the screen. People... You need to go to YouTube to look at this later if you're listening. Bore a striking resemblance to Kayla and was identified by a neighbor as Kayla Lemieux. Now, Kayla mm-hmm. denies. Kayla is on the left with the enormous pink sweater breasts and whatever. And then this person <laughs> on the right, we believe is Kayla, according to the neighbor. But Kayla's denying that Kayla ever takes off the breasts because, again, they are 100% real. <laughs> mm-hmm. And here's the, where I'm going with this. Oh, my gosh. Um, if this is Kayla, if Kayla is actually a man outside of the classroom and puts on those enormous fake boobs to go into the class, Kayla is a sick person. Kayla has yeah. a sick sexual fetish. And Kayla should not be working with children. But mm-hmm. up in Canada, they're like, to each his own, live and let live. Don't mm-hmm. be such a bigot. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have a question. Do you think there's any chance that he is just the master troll? And he is trolling everyone with these big old fake boobs and taking these ridiculous interviews and making absurd claims. 
just to troll everyone to show them how ridiculous this ideology is. Is there any chance? I'm praying or am that I just that's hopeful? true. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping. If he weren't Canadian, I would say yes. That sounds yeah. like an American thing to do. <laughs> you know, the Canadians, they're not that way. They're kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. They, they're not trolls. Um, I think this is a sick person. And by the way, I think the jig would have been up by now. I think Kayla yeah. had already, already yeah. had enough yeah. press coverage. You know, the, the person would have come out. Um, but it's actually, I mean, it's like, it's it's getting ab- actually insane. And listen to this by the New York Post with an amazing report because <laughs> Kayla sat down with the Post. <laughs> when asked about her prominent nipples, because we all know nipples like that do not exist in real life. They're like, the Lemieux not. declined oh, to no. answer. So this is where Kayla drew the line with the post. Would not, you know, the breasts, I guess, are real, but the nipples are, well, she, she Kayla wouldn't go there. <laughs> no. And, uh, no. I feel Kayla like, says, <clears throat> this is body shaming. No, I feel no like, he, said, we, he said it was body shaming. This is all body shaming. All the coverage That's what of he Kayla said. and the, the coverage of how Kayla dresses in the mm-hmm. shop class. This is by bigoted body shamers as opposed mm. to, you know, loving, supportive, open-minded people who just have to accept oh Kayla, Kayla the way Kayla is. This is what Kayla said. I People are people. It's just, it's We shouldn't be so focused on how they look. Uh, people look the way they look. They can't help it. You should embrace the way you are. You should be confident in the person you are. That's what you, Kayla, you can do whatever the hell you want, but don't dress like that or look like that while you're teaching my child. That's all. Get out. Get out of the school. Very simple. I feel like your post that you did, Megan, about the gynecology and getting your, you know, a pap smear really hit home for so many women. And I feel like they resonated with that. Like being a woman is not just putting on fake breasts and claiming they're real. Like that's, you're right. That is, he's mentally ill, but it's like this idea that men can just mock women, the most sacred parts of who we are. You know, I had mastitis and I felt like I was going to die when I was pregnant, when I, when I was nursing. And, you know, the fact that he can just make up these false claims about his breasts and his nipples, it is so deeply offensive and we laugh, but it's like, if you really think about it, this is such a war on women and look, he's protected. He is totally protected. He's the victim. If you try to say you're mentally ill, oh, he'll sue you. That's where we're at that's in so society. True. And, and that's why we have I, to push back against this. I love what you said. And it's like, if you, if you <gasps> there was a store on the Upper West Side where I live when I had my three kids, where if you went in and you, and you asked for, we used to call it a hooter hider, you know, like a modesty shield mm-hmm. for when you're nursing your baby, yeah. they would charge yeah. you a dollar. Because these are Upper West Side liberals who are like, no, show the breast. The breast is not to be sexualized. The breast is an organ that helps yeah. a baby survive. That was a bridge too far for me, but I kind of got a kick out of the whole, you know, messaging. You'd have to put a dollar into their Hooter Hider jar if you asked for one. But Gosh. it's kind of, it kind of dovetails on what you're saying. And in, yeah. in this way, you know, women of the right who are standing up for this have become the new feminists. Yes. We're, we're there with, with people who are probably in that store feeling very much the same, saying, ladies, we need to stick together on this because that's what you're saying, that the breast is not a sexual organ. The, the breast is there for a real function. It feeds a baby. It's not to have fake nipples put all over it and b- blown up into these fake enormous sizes, shoved in these tight sweaters by a man who teaches children. That's just mm-hmm. weird. There's something it's off so about it. And you so know, it's it funny because like, when, I, when like I did that bit, I had just been to the gynecologist, which is why the woman, the, the, the trans woman saying she'd been to the gynecologist was absurd to me. Oh. But on this front, because it's January, I do all my doctor's appointments, you know, annual. I, I just went and got my annual uh, mammography, uh, mammogram. Yeah. And it is, it's another thing where like the breast can be kind of scary. You know, yes. having breasts is a responsibility and a blessing and it can be kind of scary where you have to sit and you wait and you, you're you with the other ladies in the waiting room and you're kind of tense and you're a little nervous and everybody mm-hmm. realizes what a bad result could mean. And, uh, you know, it's it hurts and they squeeze the breast chills. and you have to do it, yes. right? And then the radiologist comes and you have to go down the hall and sit with him or her. And she tells you like, How'd I do on the exam? Like, what, what what bad happened, if any? And do I need a biopsy? All of which I've been through. Surgical wow. biopsy, very fucking scary. And then you know, a lot of us have dense breasts, if you're young in particular, and you got to go sit for an ultrasound. It's, another, oh, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. And we've also had the blessing of breastfeeding our babies and understanding the beauty and the love and the sustenance that comes from it. And we don't really want to see our breasts mocked and made into some ridiculous parody by someone yes. who clearly is not mentally well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So and it's well like, how, how dare, it's it's that feeling of how dare you. 
Mm-hmm. Like how, how dare you take something that is sacred to us women, claim it for yourself and then make it a mockery, a cartoon, an exaggeration. Uh, it's, it's come to the point too. It's so sad that hit, seeing this guy, like with these huge prosthetic boobs and nipples, like that this is so normal now that we almost don't even like bat an eye you know, but it's so outrageous and it is extremely offensive. And you said something a minute ago about the blackface, you know, and how that we, we talked, we've talked about that before too, but how is what we're seeing now any different? If anything, it's almost more offensive because it's not being done as an act. It's being done in a way that we're supposed to accept as real life that this is yes. real and you can't disagree with it because if you do, you're a bigot. It's woman face, but it's a whole right. body. They are appropriating our gender and the things that make us sacred beings and different than men. And then we're supposed to hush up and not say anything about it. Uh, it's it's extremely disturbing and it's highly offensive. And very sexist, it's, to be honest. But it's so true, especially like the Kayla Lemieux case really brings it home. Because Kayla's not just some trans person who's got gender dysphoria. I really believe Kayla's working out a sexual fetish on our yeah. kids, especially if yeah. Kayla runs around looking like a biological man in her downtime. That Then yeah. that means Kayla's yeah. working out her, she's getting off on, yeah. in, in the presence of our children, and therefore Kayla shouldn't be there. This is why we actually, yeah. they, they had yet another school board meeting up there about Kayla and whether they should change dress codes to disallow this kind of, you know, wardrobe and and behavior in the class. And even in Canada, the parents were mad. We have a small clip of what happened. I think it was just last night. It was just the other night Mm -hmm. uh, up in Canada about Kalo. Oh, last week. Okay, watch this. You're incompetent. The children have not been- You're terrible at this job. That we want to ensure that all the voices of the community are heard. That's what we want. We want to be able to hear your voices. If there are pieces, if there are pieces within that, di- order, please, order, please. Thank you. I will have to I'll ask you to leave if you're going to continue to disrupt the meeting. I think this is all a waste of time, right? Uh, all that they needed to do was affirm that the values and beliefs that are contained in the student dress code apply to the teachers. That's what they should have done in September. So here's the thing, gals. They're fighting back even in Canada. And we had you on not long ago to talk about the why out in California, that's where you are. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this 17-year-old girl, Rebecca, stood up to say, I was subjected to a nude trans person in the women's bathroom and I object. And that's turned into a big thing. And now there's, there's a revolt over that out where you are. We talked about how you gals went to the community meeting to say, this cannot stand. They cannot be having this at the why. And all these trans activists were there. It was so dicey. You had to be mm-hmm. escorted out by the sheriff's department because mm-hmm. they had all the activists there. Well, isn't mm-hmm. it interesting? When they had their next meeting, when the activists didn't, plural, activists did not get on their planes and their trains to drive in, it was just the community, there was almost nobody objecting uh, on the other side. They were all with you. The latest community right. meeting was 100% your way because mm-hmm. the loud, angry activist crowd did not fly in and train in and drive in to try to take over what happens in your town. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, when Britt and I went the first time, literally she and I were the only two that were opposing this tranny in the women's locker room. I mean, you remember it, Britt. It was pretty scary. It was scary. It was one of the, we've done a ton of county meetings and city meetings and um, because we're passionate and we, that's yeah. our role as citizens in society is to be engaged. And this was the first that Carrie and I were um, genuinely concerned about leaving because the the heat was so strong in that room. It was myself and Carrie and the activists showed up and there was no way knowing Santee and what Santee is like, um, it's like farm country out there. Mm-hmm. There is no way that the people who showed up were part of Santee um, community. But um, we were called words like turf, which I had never heard of. But we were called haters, um, unloving. Our Christianity was mocked. And it was uh, a very dark presence. And honestly, like that goes into like the spiritual warfare aspect of it. Like you don't leave a meeting like that without feeling 
how dark and demonic this all is rooted in. Um, you mm-hmm. have grown men trying to get into little girls' locker rooms where you have five-year-olds coming out of ballet and changing. And then there's a grown-up 56-year-old who is a male right there naked. And one of the things that I heard um, again and again and again at that meeting from the activists was, well, what if um, he chopped his penis off, you know, then he's a woman. And it's like, that's even more terrifying. It's even more terrifying that he's cut off a limb. You know, somehow we've made it so that poof magic, if you cut off a limb and give yourself a wound between your thighs, you're a woman. How degrading Yes. That that's what makes us a woman. And that mm-hmm. in society now, that's the magic. If you cut off a limb and put a wound between your thighs, you're a woman. That's all we're worth. That's our only value. Are you freaking kidding me? And guess I, what? I, the, I, yeah, I totally agree with you, Britt. And guess, get, Megan, I don't know if you've seen the update, but guess what the why decided after that meeting? You're not going to believe it. I saw something absurd about how, like, you you can no longer take off your clothes in the locker room. Yeah. So guess what? (laughs) Now, now the little girls have to go into a nasty bathroom stall with pee on the ground and change. So now women are now have to suffer because of a dude. I mean, it is so absurd and and mind boggling that this is happening in the United States of America. Like, yeah, and the you know, way that they keep going for is it's to protect, like, uh, I have it right here, but it's, they, and it's what everyone says, is it's to protect the mental health of yeah. the trans individual. It's like, what about only the mental the tra- health only. of the little girl? Well, and the women. Gonna, Britt, what's she doesn't scary, matter. What's scary is that the next meeting, is it going to be that they're protecting pedophiles? Like, if you can just say, you know, oh, we're going to protect all and, you know, that trans, you know, dude, his life matters more than Rebecca's. Like, what happens next? The pedophile gets to go in and watch little girls and, like, get to masturbate well, in the locker room just because well, that's, that's what people what are think. worried about. Yes. That's what people are worried about is that that's the pedophiles next. are going to exploit this exception. And it's not going to be all well-meaning trans people. It's going to be perverts who try to exploit the exception to get in there. I was thinking about this the other day. I went... um, I went to like a spa before I got my hair done and, um, you know, could use the sauna. And so you got to change out of your clothes and into your bathroom, whatever. And even at my age, right, even at my age, you feel a little self-conscious taking off your clothes. And this was definitely an all women's space. You just do, right? It's just not Mm -hmm. used to taking, to getting nude in front of a bunch of strangers. And these people who write these policies and these laws just have absolutely no sensitivity for, you know, you can times that by a hundred for a teenager or, you know, somebody younger, and yes. then multiply by an even greater faction when you add a biological man into the mix. There's mm-hmm. zero sensitivity for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, isn't it what Riley Gaines, I think is her name. She was the one who yeah, the tied swimmer. fifth with Leah Thomas. And she was, where was it that she was just at on a floor? She was, um, oh, was it Nebraska maybe? But she was talking about how um, awful the experience Mm -hmm. was that she was put in with um, the other swimmers. And she said, you know, to turn around and see a six foot whatever man fully intact, disrobing and looking at her while she's trying to take off her swimsuit was the most uncomfortable, uh, vulnerable situation she's ever been put in. And when they complained to their supervisors um, the swimmer girls were told to go to an LGQB counseling session so that they could learn Therapy. to be more inclusive. Yeah. To be more tolerant. Can I tell you something? There's an update on Leah Thomas that is deeply disturbing. Deeply oh. disturbing. I don't know if you saw this, but the Daily Wire um, did some reporting. I'm sourcing them, not from, not from my own research. But they report that Leah Thomas has two Instagram accounts. One oh. is the public, where they like you know, a small handful of generic photos, quoting here from the Daily Wire, promoting messages like, let trans kids play. Then a private account that that is Leah Thimas, T-H-I-M-A-S. Quoting again, in our research, we found uh, the observant Where's Wa Ro, who identified multiple Instagram posts about something called autogynephilia. Okay, autogynephilia is a male's propensity to be sexually aroused by the thought of himself as a female. And this Leah Thomas, who the the Daily Wire reports is the Leah Thomas, 
allegedly engaged with these posts about AGP or uh, autogynephilia positively on a number of occasions. Here I'm showing you an image of a, looks like a girl in a dress with a dog nose and an erect penis staring at themselves. There are, um, there are uh, like very disturbing posts of men dressed as women, like doggy style on other women, Mm -hmm. uh, of two men with erect penises, like holding each other, but one looks like they're dressed like a woman. Um, This, some of these posts were attributed to someone who is Leah's alleged romantic partner, who is a biological male, trans female, who calls Leah his girlfriend. I can't keep up. Oh my gosh. Uh, That person. I was just trying to keep up. Are they lesbians? They're, They're Well, they're fake lesbians because they're not (laughs) actual women. They're two guys. They're two biological men who are pretending to be lesbians. I guess they're more gay. I don't, I have no idea. We've crossed over. Um, This, the girlfriend, Gwen, posts and gets likes for posts, bikinis of Gwen with a genital bulge. um, Oh God. Demonic themes on here. Mm. And I'm, I'm, like there's some disturbing stuff on here by Leah Thomas liking these posts. And this is her, this is Leah's partner in life. And just like trans is one thing, working out your sexual fetishes in the locker room, in the, sw- in the pool um, and online while you're promoted by places like ABC and ESPN and so on as the second coming is another. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know if you, I Googled the word, the word poly cool. I think that's how you say it. Do you guys know what that means? Yeah, like, like multiple. Yeah, so multiple it's basically people. like they're, they're, it says it says non-monogamous relationships not committed to one person at a time. It could be sexual. It could be, I mean, you could have like, you could be into dudes, you could be into ladies, you could be into, mm-hmm. I mean, what's next? Like, I mean, this opens the door. And, and like Britt said earlier, it's this protected class. Like Leah Thomas is totally protected, totally protected more than us women are. So, and Carrie, think about it. Like if Leah Thomas has this, this autogynephilia thing that that, that she's reportedly liking online, again, sourcing the Daily Wire, um, that means Leah Thomas gets off when Leah Thomas puts on the female bathing suit and gets in the pool with the other females. And then the other females are running around naked because they have to in front of Leah Thomas, and something's deeply wrong. Yeah, it's a fetish. Yeah, it, it a is a fetish. fetish. And Genevieve right. Gluck, she's an author, um, one of the authors and investigators at Redux, and I've watched her on countless interviews discussing the trans phenomenon and from a very um, measured place. You know, she's a feminist. She doesn't agree with everything that I um, stand for and vice versa, but she is a wealth of information. And one of the things that she has pinpointed is um, if you look at where trans historically, what we're seeing now, like the Leah Thomases and everything that Daily Wire is posting about, there um, there is a connection to the porn industry. And when you go down the rabbit hole, um, even back in the 70s, there was porn, it's called sissy porn. And the whole point of sissy porn was you would have two men and one man had to be humiliated. And the the humiliation would be that that man had to dress in women's outfits and Mm. high heels and women's lingerie and wear lipstick. And it was a part of this fetish. Well, you had from that many men who started doing this in outside of the bedroom and the trans movement back in the seventies, there's a very strong connection to this sissy porn and this humiliation that um, gave rise to the trans movement. And it's interesting that daily wire is showing a similar connection to this getting off on this autogynophilia, which is connected to that, you know? And I think that- right. Overall, there's a concern that we have just um, glossed over all that and just yes. assumed the best. Yeah. When oh, and Britt, maybe- as you point out, when the girls objected on the UPenn team, mm-hmm. they were the ones sent to therapy. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Leah Thomas apparently needs some therapy to get over the need to get off in cross-dressing. Yeah, because we're just and supposed to assume more. that it's totally normal. We're supposed to assume that that's normal and that our reaction is abnormal. So we're the ones that need to be fixed. And this again, it goes why... back to the Don Lemon thing. We well, we are the punching bag. 
And also this Gwen, is- his girlfriend, okay, she's a freaking weirdo. She posted on her whatever it was, Twitter or whatever, Instagram, that Leah is going to bring about the collapse of Western civilization. Like yeah, yeah. totally saying that publicly. That's Very exactly strange. what's happening. They're, they're promising well, something that they're actually doing. Like they're doing it in real time. That's, I mean, that's the reason why it's like, <laughs> there. we deserve to investigate what's actually happening as opposed yes, to the yes. narrative that's being fed to us. Yes. And, you know, I'm in the camp of, look, I know trans people. I've, I have trans people in my family and they are nothing like these people. They're they're kind and they're loving and they're respectful and they would never want any of this shit. They want to be left alone. They want to lead a quiet life and they had genuine dysphoria. And I, I can get behind their pronouns and being respectful of them. All this other shit needs to be fought. It needs to be broken down. It needs to be investigated. And we need to stand up for the biological women who are forced to deal with this in unsafe circumstances. So tell me about Battle Cry. We are so excited about Battle Cry. You know, it was honestly born out of everything we were just talking about is we realize we're at the tipping point in society and our rights uh, as women are at stake because we're seeing these new super rights being manufactured and given to men. You know, men can now get into our locker rooms and our bathrooms and take our jobs and win our awards. And we reached a point where we're like, hey, (laughs) It's not okay. We're not happy about this anymore. And um, we're we're um, finding the spirit of our grandmothers and our great grandmothers who fought for their rights in society. And so we founded, along with our friend Melissa, um, the Battle Cry, and it's the Battle Cry US. And we are um, we're going to push back against what is coming at women. This war on women to protect our daughters and to stand um, to stand for our rights. So if people, Carrie, are dealing with this issue in their town, can they can they join the battlecry.us and get help from you guys? Or how does it work? Yes, absolutely. You can head to our Instagram or Twitter. It's the battlecry underscore US. And okay. we are rallying the troops. I mean, we are declaring that we are at war. Like it is beyond playing nice. And we are declaring war. The war on women, the war on men, the war on children, and the war on truth objective truth. If we lose that, Megan, we are so screwed as a society. And we're seeing right now the attack on women. And that's what we're focusing on. And so we want all women to shout their battle cry to us. What makes you uniquely a woman? Tell us your story. We will share your story. We want to elevate everyday women and say, this is your battle cry. And we're shouting it from the rooftops. And we will not be erased. We will not be mocked. And we will not be eliminated by men any longer. Yes. Oh, I'm shaking my head. Yes. As you're talking like, yes, I'm signing up. I love it. I'm glad you're getting organized. You're too powerful a force to, you know, stay local. You need to help and spread this message beyond. It's such a pleasure, ladies. Thank you so much as always, Carrie and Britt. See you soon, I hope. We love you. Bye. Love you too. All right. We're going to be back tomorrow with a special guest, Ben Shapiro, back on the program. There's so much to go over with him. Oh my God, I can't wait. Um, And we'll also have a deep dive on the Alex Murdoch trial, which is getting intense. 